Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. We're studying the scriptures tonight, Romans chapter 5, verse 13. For until, law, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your truths and all we have and enjoy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, we covered this in detail in chapter 4, so I'm not going to go over it again. Uh, God in true justice. And that's something you want to also pay attention to in the world today. They use this word fair. Fair is bad. What you want is justice, not fairness. Little kids say, that's not fair. In other words, they mean they didn't get what they thought they had coming to them. What God does is give people what they have coming to them, justice. And justice is depicted uh, by men as a woman with a blindfold holding a pair of balances. Uh, oh, how they twist things. And in the 70s, they had a movie, uh, and they tried to twist that, you know, that justice is blind. Justice is supposed to be blind because she's not supposed to uh, affect the balances. She's supposed to hold the balances out there, and they're supposed to equal the, with the weights. And she's not supposed to have eyes to see this so she can rig the scales. And, of course, they're saying, oh, no, you're bl we're getting a lot of that today. The justice is blind. And... Um, that's because what they do is they put a light on something and then they try to blame it on everyone. They just had another thing on the news tonight with uh, some uh, police officer arresting somebody. Nobody got shot, nobody got hurt, but they just didn't think he did it right. And uh, they've got the picture all fuzzied up so you can't see everything. And because what he did was uh, they were having a little bit of an altercation. He pulled his gun out. I was like, oh my God, he pulled his gun out. Now, if you watch the thing, it looks like uh, a couple of the guys, they came around behind him, and it looked like they tried to grab his gun. And I think that's why he pulled it out, because they tried to go for it, and I think he pulled it out so they couldn't get it. But he doesn't get a chance to defend himself. Uh, the picture's fuzzied up, and uh, you can't tell for sure. And uh, folks, there's 999,000 officers operating in the United States of America. They got this one little incident and if he was wrong, because some of them are, he's one man, and that's something they notice. Like, well, all the other uh, uh, officers behaved okay. Just look. Then, if he's one man, that one man needs to be dealt with. That's not the police officers of America. That's a man. One man is not acting right, and they're trying to. Uh, they're they're going to cause big riots. Crime is going up skyrocketing in the big cities because the police are not being proactive. Because the police are fearful that uh, if they don't do something just right, they're going to be the criminal. And um, that's not good. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. All right? God in true justice does not impute sin to those who are truly not aware of their sin of their life. Furthermore, God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked even. And this is something important. That's why Jesus said, judge, righteous, judgment. I do not want, we should not ever support or justify anybody that does something wrong. Now that doesn't mean we can't love them. That doesn't mean we can't well, I shouldn't have said support. Support them. We just can't support them in their sin or their error. Um, in most cases, for Christians, it's just a matter of apology. All you got to do is have the uh, character uh, to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And then we should forgive and forget it and move on. I'm not talking about crimes and people getting shot. I'm just talking about interpersonal relationships. Uh, if Christians don't have that... Uh, Boy, is this world in trouble because we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Preadventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for 50 righteous that are therein? If you follow that through, Abraham gets God down to 10 because Abraham's concerned about Lot and his family. And that's the size of Lot's family. 
And the Lord says, I find 10 righteous men. Now, when years ago, when my wife and I went to Israel, and we went to the Wailing Wall, the Jews have a tradition since they reclaimed the Wailing Wall. Every Sabbath, they have 10 men go specifically to the wall and pray for the city. And the thought is, if we have 10 praying men praying at the wall, God will not destroy Jerusalem because God said he wouldn't destroy Sodom if he could find 10 righteous men in it. That's an interesting thought. There are places where people take God's word serious and they're not even saved. Because we're not talking about Messianic Jews, but we're talking about Shemitic traditional Jews. Now, it's not going to be too long. And the Lord returns after they go through a terrible tribulation. Those, the Jew is going to be the head of the nations again, not the Gentiles. But that's prophecy and that's the future. The body of Christ will and this is a good picture here, will leave before the wrath of God. Now, there's all kinds of debate today, pre-trib, mid-trib, and everything like that. I am still a pre-trib. That's what I was taught. That's what I believe. Uh, there's nothing I've been shown to prove conclusively that it's not pre-trib. It is absolutely pre-wrath, okay? Uh, there's no doubt about it. For God, here, right here, for God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The church will not be here when God pours out his wrath. The church is going to leave before the tribulation or before the last three and a half years. I still believe it will be pre-tribulational, but so nobody's shocked, and I've, given you, I've, I've shown you the possibility that it may be pre-wrath before the last three and a half years. That's, you know, you study the scriptures, all right? Now, that does not mean, and this is the reason a lot of people believe we're going to go through the tribulation, is they don't know how to forgive. So when somebody does something wrong, they think that they have to be uh, severely punished. So they think and they believe that the church has to go through the tribulation. And that's not the case. This does not mean we'll escape persecutions from the world. And that doesn't mean we don't uh, sow what we reap in this life. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch, at Icom, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I've only had verbal persecution. Thank God that's all we've had to endure in America. Uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Uh, yeah, it can hurt, wound your soul, but it, it shouldn't bother you that people say something negative about you and, and something I'm truthful about you. Uh, God knows the truth. And uh, your character, your uh, continuing on uh, will dissipate uh, false beliefs by people rather quickly. Uh, if somebody hears something bad about you and they wonder about it and then they see you still living normal right before the Lord a year later, they'll say, oh, I must not have been true. That's what, that's, that's what you need to learn as a Christian, especially that we have the blessings of living right now where there's no physical persecution. Poor Paul was whipped. Poor Paul was caned. Poor Paul was shipwrecked. Poor Paul went hungry. Paul suffered a lot physically. He said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. There's no doubt in his, uh, his faithfulness to the Lord because they beat him raw. And um, it would be humbling, I would think, to meet such a man, uh, the man that suffered as much as he did. And it should be humbling. You're seeing in the Middle East, you're seeing professing. I don't know if they're saved or lost. I don't know if they're the professing church or the possessing church um, losing their heads. And we're saved. And if they're just professors, if they're just being hypocrites 
and they've never repented of their sins and trust Christ, but they're just uh, professing. Look at the character that they have without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and without a real salvation. They, they would not uh, convert, and they chose death. I would tend to think that they're saved, they had to been saved. Uh, I would tend to think that they had to personally know the Lord. Um, scarcely for a righteous man would uh, some die, but while we're yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Well, I wouldn't uh, die for a Savior that I didn't believe was a Savior. I mean, if I was just a professing Christian, I didn't believe in, the, in my heart, I wouldn't let somebody cut my head off. I'd say, hey, all right, I'm reasonable. I can, I'll be a worshiper of Allah today if it keeps me alive. But if you're a real Christian and you really have character and you really love the Lord, and that's a real test of your love of the Lord, um, I've, I'm saying you have to, I think you have to have Christ in you, the hope of glory, to go down the martyrdom trail. I don't know. God knows. Nor will we escape the trials of uh, daily life and death until the Lord returns uh, in the air for his church at the translation. And that's something else that Christians, uh, they stumble at. Um, Wherefore, by one man, sin in the world and death by sin. Uh, I might die prematurely because I get in my car and drive down the road and some drunk hits me head on. And I say, oh, why God let it happen? Uh, I'm living in a dangerous world. Death is in the world. And it can take any Christian at any time um, unless the Lord wants them to stay longer. Unless the Lord and you are close and the Lord wants you. If the Lord wants you here, nothing can harm you. But if the Lord says, well, I don't really have any need of them in the world. They might as well come home. You can, you can, death can come after you. The Lord may let them come and get you. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who was a figure of him that was to come. So even though God did not charge every man with sin, every man still died because sin passed down in the seed as a synodynamic nature uh, brings death as a poison in the process of time. And that's the thing that people don't pay attention to is that death poisons us. And Adam and Eve sinned. They didn't die physically. They died immediately spiritually. But they died a little later in time because sin began its poisoning process. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Folks, you ought to be overjoyed on a daily basis that you're saved. You ought to be overjoyed on a daily basis. You don't have to worry about give an account to God at the great white throne judgment and being cast in the lake of fire because your works are not going to be good enough. Uh, you repent of your sins and you received a free gift. Uh, you know what a free gift is? It's a blessing. Especially when it's eternal life and it's going to last forever and ever and ever. And the truth of the matter is it's like a Timex watch. It can take a licking, but it keeps on ticking. Really? Really? It's a joy. Think about it. Pray about it. It's the goodness of God. Notice our Redeemer is in just our redemption, and our Redeemer is one man. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one meter between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. No other name. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under uh, heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So that requires, and boy, if Christians don't know this, the world does. They had a uh, video clip that I saw down in Florida. This atheist 
somehow got to they open up the um, uh, town business with a prayer. So somehow he got himself into the cycle or something. And I was very pleased. Uh, about three quarters of the town government got up and walked out while he prayed to Allah and he prayed to Satan and he prayed to Thor and he prayed to uh, Zeus and he prayed to um, a whole bunch of uh, false deities and then insulted the Lord, maybe Jesus will forgive us, real, real smart aleck, and then uh, professed to be an atheist that didn't believe in anything. And I thank God that most of the people had the sense to just get up and walk out. And then after he prayed, they all came back in and conducted business. That's the, that's the culture we've got today. You've got a, this thing where well, you've got to let everybody in there. You've got to let a hypocrite and a nut in there. He's got to be a hypocrite because who does he think he's fooling when he prays to all these different gods, including the devil, and then says he doesn't believe in anything, he's an atheist. That's, a, that's as hypocritical as you can be. And we're tolerating that stuff. Adam sinned, so everybody sins as sin is in his seed. And not as it was by one that sinned, so the gift for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. One offering covers every sin, because he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. All right. Seeing that then we have a great high priest that has passed into heavens, Jesus, Son of God. Now, here's the encouragement and exhortation for you. Let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly on the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the help of need, in the time of need. There are three points by which sin comes to us. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. So the Lord was tempted in all points, not necessarily the same sinful temptations, but he's tempted in all points of sin. Love not the world, near the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world pass away, and the lust thereof. But he that doth there, he that doth the will of God abideth forever. And this is the will of God, that you believe on him whom the Lord sent. So God's will for your life is to repent of your sins and put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you'll find Satan's temptations that come in all forms of sins, but it's only three real uh, issues. Uh, temptation of Jesus Christ was turn those uh, turn the bread in this uh, stone into bread uh, and that's a deep um, deeper sin than realized because it's something that the Lord's going to do during the tribulation it's a it's a future miracle the devil is always trying to confuse people and get them to be out of time timing is a critical thing because of time and judgment therefore the misery of man is great you can do the right thing at the at the wrong time and it ends up wrong uh, timing. Uh, if you were in the Old Testament, there's no way in the world that you could repent of your sins and trust Christ. You had to take a covering of an animal and have animal blood on an altar for your redemption. In the New Testament, you cannot uh, cover your sins on an altar with animal blood. You have to, uh, it's a spiritual salvation where you have to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do, it the, do the right thing at the wrong time and you're in trouble. I hope I, I say that right. I hope I said it right. Good. Love not the world. Now, when it says love not the world, it's not telling you not to love life. Uh, I love life. You should love life. You, have, you should love life because I don't care how negative you think your life is in this circumstance situation. You have it so much better than most of the people that ever lived. Uh, I eat, you eat better than most kings ate through history. You travel more than most kings traveled through history. You have more uh, things to experience than most people all through history. Count your blessings. If you're not rejoicing in what you have, sit down and start counting your blessings. 
count it and see what God's done. It's, God has given us a wonderful life. And you know what the problem of it is? That's one of the major problems that we're dealing with with the inner cities and the problem. You have a lot of people that just don't have the initiative. Uh, if you can't find a job, go out and start a job. And work and receive an honest reward and you'll prosper in, in time. You say, well, I'm not, uh, I'm not prospering. Excuse me, do you have a color TV? Well, I'm not prospering. Excuse me, do you have a car, two cars? Well, I'm not prospering. Do you have a home to live in? Well, I'm not prospering. Do you get to eat whatever you want? Do you have fruits and vegetables? Do you have uh, meat? Uh, well, I'm not. What do you mean you're not prospering? Well, I don't have what so-and-so has. I can't keep up with the Joneses. That doesn't mean you're not prospering. That just means the Joneses are prospering more. Do you realize that today in this country, most welfare recipients have all the basics of life with televisions and cell phones and Maybe they don't have as, as sharp a cell phone as your um, Apple 6 or, uh, or that. Maybe they've got an uh, Apple 1, but they got a, they got a, they got a cell phone. That's a prosperous country we live in. Oh, we're not prospering anymore. We're not prospering the way we used to, as we used to increase in prosperity. We're on the wrong track, but we're not, we're not hurting that bad yet. Three points. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes. Go over the Old Testament. The horse thief had two daughters crying, give, give. People are never satisfied. When, uh, when tempted, answer the world, uh, the flesh and the devil with the word of God for the victory. For if by one man's offense death reign, by one much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. This morning I'm giving the message. Learn to plead the blood daily. You don't need to have salvation ever occur again. It's once for all forever. But you walk through this world and the way the Bible pictures it is your feet get dirty and they need to be washed. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness or all sin. We reign when we have the strength to suffer with him, then we can reign with him. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Most of the suffering in America is to be reviled or reproached by some wicked individual. You know who's going to be upset and curse me? A sodomite a transvestite, a whoremonger, an adulterer, a sinner that is still embracing their sin. You say, why is that? Because I come as an ambassador and I bring first and offer them the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, but then the Lord tells me, cry aloud, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions. And when they're, they're when I let them know what displeases God, they get mad at me. They hate the messenger. Most people don't realize, now, you, see, these things are difficult to say. I care because God cares. I care because God has called me. I care because it's my responsibility, duty, and mission. But when I'm over there taking care of my wife and, and, and loving her and washing her and cleaning her and changing her and clothing her and everything, you think I'm sitting around here and thinking about what terrible people are out there and what people are saying about me? It should be the same way with you. Let it fall off like water off a duck's back. Uh, it's meaningless. Uh, people that curse you today will bless you tomorrow. People that bless you today will curse you tomorrow. Uh, that's the way the world is. Love not the world, and don't be that way. 
just try to be a blessing to everybody. But be truthful. Therefore, by uh, uh, the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. A glorious, beautiful, wonderful gift. Someday, when you're on the other side, someday when you're at the great white throne watching the judgment of those that despised and rejected the gift, someday in eternity, when you're enjoying the blessings of a glorified body and in a uh, perfect uh, mind and a perfect soul and perfect fellowship and unity with your Father, you're going to look at that and say, what a glorious, wonderful gift. It's going to mean so much more to you than it does now. If you'd only realize how beautiful that gift is now. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, very their sound went into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. I'm always hearing people looking for an excuse, always complaining, well, what about the heathen that didn't hear? The Bible tells you that it went to all the world. It took about three years for God to spread the gospel through the world after the crucifixion. And God has a way of getting the truth to everybody. And the Bible says, day unto day, night unto night, the heavens declare the glory of God. Man's without excuse. You see the creation? There's a creator called cause and effect, common sense. But people try to come up with evolution and some kind of a lie to avoid the truth. That's what the Bible says, because they love not the truth. They love not the truth. Now, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what you've got to give people if you're going to be a testimony, a witness, and a soul winner for the Lord. They need God's word. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Now, what do you think about these individuals, Christians, that are committing sins, living like the devil, say, well, I got liberty. That's wonderful that you do in your standing, but the whole New Testament is exhorting you and, and, and condemning you for living fleshly and walking in the flesh. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared to all men. Okay, you got saved, you got this wonderful gift, and it teaches us something. If you really got saved, it's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What's your problem? Looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it, it's like that um, uh, song uh, on, uh, of um, you know, that old-time country singer. Uh, Kate, you made me do it. No, Kate didn't make you do it. You're the murderer. Uh, well, it's her fault that I raped her. Her dress was short. No, you're the rapist. You, you were selfish. You were angry. We don't have a right to harm other people. And you should be looking. I can't wait till the Lord comes back and all this wickedness is gone. And all you've got is godly, sanctified, harmless people. And... It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be heaven on earth. Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. When he gets back, the wicked are gone. Now, our job is to have mercy on them. Our job is to forgive them. Our God is to preach the gospel to them. Our God is to tell them what God expects of them and how to live. And here's what you want to tell these folks. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Oh, I'm saved. Hell, do you go teaching us that denying ungodliness. Oh, that's works. No. The grace that gets you saved teaches you and teaches me and should be teaching them to act like a Christian, walk like a Christian, talk like a Christian, put on Christ, take his righteousness and his character and use it for your life. You got this one. Take my life and let it be for your glory. 
For if by one man's offense death reigned, by one much more they which receive abundance of grace and of gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. You got to have strength. Read over there in the book of Revelation. Thou hast a little strength. Why do they have strength? They, had, they, they kept his word and they did not deny his name. You want to have a little strength? Keep God's word. Don't deny his name. You can reign. And boy, is it going to be embarrassing at the judgment seat of Christ when you're going to tell your Lord and Savior, well, I live like the world, live like the devil because uh, I couldn't take it. They said bad things about me. They said I was stupid. Uh, they said I was a religious fanatic. They, and the Lord's going to stand there and you're going to see the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side and, and the marks on his head and, and, and the whipping on his back. And you're going to be so ashamed. Uh, and what's going to make it worse is for that you deserve to go to hell and he's not going to send you he's going to forgive you but he's going to cut your inheritance short he's going to take away your rewards but he's already forgiven you he's not going to send you to hell you're going to have to look at him and say, my God he didn't do me wrong but I did him wrong after he did me right. The goodness of God needed the repentance. God's wonderful. Romans 5.19, For if by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners. It's in the seed. It's called the Adamic nature. So by the obedience of one, it's in the seed, that was God's seed, shall many be made righteous. It's in the divine nature. saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. How many have ever been in a frightening circumstance where you think you're going to suffer some immense harm? Nobody cared but you. You're all alone. Now, think to an evening, being in a garden, in the darkness, when there's no street lights and so the darkness is real dark and you know you're going to be crucified and you know you're going to bear the sins of the whole world and you know nobody cares because all your disciples have fallen asleep the world's living its life except for your heavenly father that says, son, the only way these folks are going to be saved is you're going to have to give your life, your righteousness, and your soul a ransom for them. And the son says, father, if there's any other way, but if not, we're going to do it your way. What strength, what dignity, what beauty, what character, what wonderfulness. And when they were come around to the place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. I don't know how you have that type of abuse done to you and be totally innocent, totally without fault, and not object to the way you're being treated. But he opened not his mouth. He was fully accepting the Father's will. He's going, to, he's going to die. His soul is going to descend into hell. He's doing it the way you and I do, by faith. I can't really explain the mystery of godliness, the incarnation. It's a hard thing to explain. Uh, God in a man's body. But he's going to die. Just like we're going to die. And he's going to die in faith. 
but because he's God, death isn't going to hold him. But it's kind of like, I wonder if he suffered like, I've flown on airplanes a lot. I've flown over most of this world. But I, an airplane is supposed to be safe, but because of the nature of an airplane, every time I go, to, go in an airplane, I always have a little, I hope this plane isn't going to crash. I hope this plane's going to get to the other place. You know, it's by faith. What, what love of his father, what trust of his father, trusting his father would deliver him. And his father did. Wow. Wherever the law entered in, that the offense might abound, but where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Have you ever prayed in one day and tried to get all your sins under the blood? Can I give you an example? And I'm not trying to boast, but um, people like to accuse me of being a sinner. And I'm a sinner saved by grace. Um, but at my age, um, you know, I get up in the morning, and I feed myself, I study, I make DVDs, I get my wife up, I fix her up, I feed her, um, I do more studying, I go to the store, I go to the dentist, um, I do those things. Uh, most of the sins that I commit are up here. And when I get down on my knees in the morning to pray for the sins of yesterday, I've had so many sins that I can't remember. And I don't live a wild and woolly life. I'm not out swindling from people. I'm not out stealing from people. I'm not out defaming people. I'm not out there in a world committing what happens all the time. I just uh, think about something and think, well, it should be this way. No, it should be another way. Wherever the law entered, that the offense might abound. But when we were, but where sin abound, grace did much more abound. Now what I want you to think about is this. Have you ever thought about how many sins you've committed in your entire life? Now I go back before I got saved? Uh-oh. God's grace was greater than every sin that I've committed in 63 years of my existence. God's grace is greater than every sin, every heinous and wicked thought, every strange and depraved imagination, every thought of harming somebody, getting even with somebody, uh, thinking incorrectly of somebody. Anytime you stole anything, anytime you slandered anybody, anytime you betrayed anybody, Anytime you did anything in sin, God's grace is greater. Isn't God altogether lovely? Isn't God beautiful, wonderful? It's the goodness of God that leadeth to repentance. Romans 5.21, that a sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Here we come again. God forbid. How shall we there are any that are dead to sin live any longer there? If you repent of your sins, you trust Christ, and you died with him, and he died with you, and He's given you his life. How do you still live in sin? How is it that at 63 years of age, where life keeps me away from a lot of sin, still have a nature of sin, and still sin sins? How do we still live in sin? I guess Paul said, in me, that is in my flesh, 
swalloweth no good thing. Real humility is to really have a true appraisal of yourself and realize that before God, there's no good thing in your flesh. Now, what the devil will do is come around and challenge you to start comparing yourselves with others to build up your pride. that's what takes a lot of Christians and causes them to stumble because they start comparing themselves with somebody else and so I got to do this more than them and better than them and they're not serving God God just wants the honest truth from you thou desire truth in your parts God wants his Christians to confess their sins put them under the blood and try every day to walk in the spirit but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, being de uh, uh, deceiving and being deceived. That's what I was speaking about earlier. Um, there's going to be some cataclysmic problems in the next few years. You don't need to be afraid of them. They're going to come because there's so much deception, so much lying, so much falsehood, so much deceiving. Know you not that so many of us are, uh, were baptized unto Jesus Christ, were baptized in his death? You're saved, you're baptized in his death. Get away from sin. Walk away from it. Come out, be separate. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. That's what we've been talking about tonight. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. I can't wait. For we shall see him as he is. I can't wait. And every man that hath this hope in himself purifieth himself. You're really hoping the Lord's coming back and you're really looking forward to seeing him. You're going to be purifying yourself. You're not going to be a hypocrite. You're going to struggle with sin and you're going to wage a war against it. Even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin, and in him is no sin. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Is your life new? It should be new every day. You've had all your sins forgiven, past, present, and future, but you've got to walk your life in this world, and God wants you to walk it to his honor and glory. He wants you to walk it as a Christian. He wants you to walk in newness of life, not in the old way. For by one spirit we are all baptized in the one body. Whether it be Jews, Gentiles, whether we be bound or free and have been all made to drink in the one spirit. It's a holy spirit. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight years old shall be circumcised among you, every man, child in your generations. He that is born in the, uh, in the house or bought with money or a stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is uh, bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Under the Old Testament, the flesh was circumcised, cut away from flesh. And circumcision was a sign to the Jew that there was a problem with the seed. It was corrupted. There was the Adamic nature in the seed passed down from the father to the children, from the father to the children for generations. And there needed to be a new birth. And the seed needed to be needed a new body. And it's coming. It's going to be the Lord's body. We've had our soul saved. We've had the Holy Spirit indwell us, but we're looking for this new body. But how do we get saved? We got saved by a supernatural operation. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the additions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried in him in baptism, wherein also you are raised with him through the faith and the operation of God, who had raised us from the dead. This is your understanding of how you have this old nature in your flesh, but you can be sinless 
and your standing because when you repent of your sins and trust Christ as your Savior, God cuts away your soul from your body. The Holy Spirit enters your soul and cleanses it and it seals it. And just as in the Old Testament, the circumcision cut the skin away from the flesh, the Holy Spirit cuts the soul away from the body. And now any sin that you commit is to your body in your flesh and your soul stands before God sinless. Now it's a question of whether you let your body rule or you let the hidden man of the heart. And the Bible says be filled with the Spirit. You can have the Spirit, but you need to be filled with the Spirit. It's like, to give you an idea, picture a, a flask of water and you pour water into a jar. Well, and then you seal that jar. Well, the jar has water in it, but it's not filled. But if you put a flame under it and it boils and the steam rises, it fills the jar. When you get into the Spirit, it's when you let the Holy Spirit permeate your flesh and control it by crucifying your flesh and walking in that Spirit. That's what God wants from us. Walk in newness of life since he's redeemed us. And you should have the security of knowing you're safe forevermore. You cannot be lost, but you can stumble. But if you stumble, you can confess your sins and put them under the blood and plead the blood and you can walk again. A righteous man can fall seven times yet he'll rise again. God's wonderful. It's great to be a Christian. Come to Calvary. We'd like to have you come and find the truth of God's word and the joy of, and the peace of walking in God's spirit. Thank you. Have a good night.